Hi guys, welcome back to our channel. If you're new here, my name's Ashton. I'm Jonathan. And along with our son Jack, we're the Black Forest family. Welcome to part three of our video series where we are going to be digging into the differences between American and German housing. Yeah, so in our very first episode in the series, we talked about the form, structure, and building materials of homes in both countries. In our second episode, we focused on purchasing trends and costs associated to buying a house in the United States and in Germany. But in today's episode, we're going to be looking a lot more in depth into heating, cooling, and energy costs again, between the United States and Germany. More specifically, we also wanted to take a closer look at America's addiction to air conditioning and what happened in history that really drove the German market to pursue more energy efficient systems. So we recently got to visit the construction site of our new house here in the Black Forest in Germany, and we got to see the inner workings of the energy and heating system that we're going to be using. So as Americans, this is something that was really an eye-opening experience, and I was super, super excited to learn a little bit more about. Yeah, we've shared in previous videos that our house is actually going to meet KFW 55 standards. And in addition to specifications on building materials and the overall design, Part of that rating system actually does deal a lot with how energy efficient our home is, including its heating system and the type of energy sources that are actually supplying our home. And before you start typing, yes, we know this subsidy has been canceled recently by the German government. We got in and approved just in time. Yeah, we ended up being pretty lucky overall, I would yeah. say. Um, however, we did think that in talking about our KFW 55 experience and pursuing a more energy efficient home, that this would be the perfect opportunity to take a more detailed look into heating, cooling, and energy systems in Germany and what we were used to growing up back in the United States. All right, so let's go ahead and dive into part three of the series, heating, cooling, and energy use. Okay, so for starters, I think it's probably important that since we're going to be switching between English and German terminology, that we clear up a few of those terms up front. So for example, when we refer to systems in the United States, we will most commonly use the abbreviation HVAC, which stands for heating, ventilation, and air conditioning. And similarly, when we talk about German systems, we'll probably also be speaking about HLK, which stands for Heizung, Luftung, and Klimatechnik. So in addition, fair warning, our data in the United States is gonna be in Fahrenheit and Germany naturally is gonna be in centigrade and we'll do the best we can to show up both units of temperature on the screen. So let's briefly go over some quick statistics about both HVAC and HLK in the United States and Germany. So in the United States, as you can see from this map, the choice of primary heating fuel varies considerably by region, contributing to regional differences in total expenditures. Natural gas is most common in every region except for the South, whereas electric heating is more prevalent. Heating oil is much more common in the Northeast than in other regions, while propane is actually more common in the Midwest. However, we can say that as a whole, both electric heating and natural gas are the two most predominant heating sources throughout the United States. And in Germany, roughly half of the 40 million homes are heated with natural gas, a quarter with oil, and almost 14% with district heating. However, the trend in new German buildings is quite different. As you can see with the graphic, electric heat pumps and solar heat in combination with gas have, over the last decade, taken a leap forward. So switching gears here, going back to the US, the predominant heating system is going to be a gas furnace that's used in combination with a forced air heating distribution system, otherwise known as ductwork. This is really common because it's the exact same ductwork that will also be utilized typically for a central AC unit in their homes. However, by contrast, looking at Germany, the predominant heating system is of course radiant heat. These are usually through radiators either located in the floor, under a window, or as a heated towel rack in your bathroom. But we don't want to get too caught up in costs here. That is its own rabbit hole that we're going to dive down some other day for its own video, not today. But we did want to mention the differences in the cost of electricity in the United States and how that compares with Germany because this is a pretty influential factor in determining your heating solution 
solution or your air conditioning solution or lack thereof air conditioning. Yeah, absolutely. So to take a look at a couple of those numbers here, currently the average price of electricity for residential customers in the United States was 14.12 cents per kilowatt hour. That is, of course, American US dollar cents. However, by comparison, the average price of electricity for residential customers in Germany was 32.16 cents per kilowatt hour. Now that is of course in Euro cents. Now I'm already getting cents and cents mixed up here. So in short, Germans pay on average three times the cost for electric energy. All right, so this next bit certainly does not come as a surprise to us, but America is the leader in the world for the amount of energy used per capita for cooling or air conditioning. According to the Energy Information Association, 87% of US homes have air conditioning with 75% of those having central AC units as opposed to window or wall mounted AC units. And given the cost of both running and installing those air conditioning systems, it again probably comes as no surprise that wealthier homes are more likely to have air conditioning than lower income households. However, as you can see from this graphic, even among low income households, more than 75% have some source of air conditioning. Now, interestingly enough, in the United States, the biggest disagreement is not whether you have air conditioning or you don't have, <laughs> it is what do you set the temperature to on the wall? Oh, and wars I are have waged. To, yes, yes, Wars sure. are waged over and this. This is definitely like the biggest rite of passage of becoming a dad is being in control of what temperature the house is set at, at least for my memories and everybody else. Or that thinking I know. you're in control of the setting on yes. your house, sure. Prime and eat you might as well give her your wallet and your 401k while you're at it. Brad, do you let the kids touch the thermostat at your house? Why, no. The thermostat is a sacred covenant. I can't believe we're even talking about this. This is madness. According to a 2015 residential energy consumption survey, around 20% of American homes are set to 69 degrees Fahrenheit or lower when the people are home in the summer. Another 18% are 77 degrees or warmer. That, by the way, would not have been my home. No, thank you. But there are partisans for 72 degrees and 75 degrees and everywhere else. Quite frankly, it's a balancing act between comfort and cost. But the cost of this cooling obsession is staggering. The US is a nation with 329 and a half million people, which is accounting for just four and a half percent of the world population. And they consume more energy for air conditioning than the rest of the world combined. It uses more electricity for cooling than Africa does for everything, which by the way, has a population of 1.1 billion people. But you know, a really interesting factor into all of this is that the beast of air conditioning seems to be one that is a self-feeding problem because air conditioners employ the same operating principles as refrigerators. They transfer heat from the cool interior, be it a fridge, room, or building, to the relative warmth outside. And this ultimately contributes to what's termed the urban heat island effect. One study found that AC units in Phoenix, Arizona, heat the nighttime air temperature outside by up to two degrees centigrade, which of course encourages more residents to blast even colder air into their homes to compensate for it. It's like a runaway freight train. Exactly. And New York subway stations also bake in the summer to more than 48 degrees C, partially because air conditioned trains are just pumping out incredible amounts of heat. All right, so if we're actually going to be doing a fair comparison here of the US and Germany, we probably also should talk at least a little bit about the role that climate and geography plays in all of this, because after all, the temperature and weather of where you live undoubtedly influences the amount of AC that you might actually end up using. But yes, we recognize the United States is huge and it really depends on which area you want to examine. But for us, we're from the Midwest where the summer is extremely hot and extremely humid. Yeah. That's the biggest factor for us. In the summertime, it is so hot and sticky and gross outside. You just want to escape to an air conditioned room. 
However, in Germany, we could still have plus 40 degrees C days in the summertime, but they are much more tolerable because of the lower humidity. It's so damn hot. Okay, so this next map is probably going to hit home for our American audience because I don't know about you, but for me, the maps that I was shown as a kid really made it sound like in a longitudinal sense where the US is and where Europe is, I always thought they were pretty level with one another. But as you can see from this map, that is totally not the case. The reality is if we were to draw a line laterally from Berlin, we're pretty much going to end up on the southern tip of Alaska. But again, guys, without giving an entire lecture on meteorology, climatology, and oceanography, because if we're really gonna dive into that, that's like its whole other series here. The next map that I'm about to show you actually probably sums this up a lot more succinctly. As you can see from this graphic, to be blunt, America just has more extreme temperature patterns on average. It's hotter in the summer and colder in the winter. All right, so we get it. We live in a very green city and by comparison, a very climate conscious country. However, there are some advantages to air conditioned rooms and the heat of the summer that even some of our German friends cannot easily dismiss. Studies have clearly shown there's an improvement in work productivity, improved sleep patterns, and a reduction in mortality when you have the room cooled down. But Germany, and really all of Europe for that matter, have actually come up with some pretty ingenious ways of keeping the room cool even when outdoor temperatures rise. For starters, EU regulations actually force companies to design their spaces to be more energy efficient. In addition, many German buildings actually employ some pretty cool passive cooling designs, such as those exterior blinds that can help keep the sun out and help keep interior rooms a lot cooler. So for instance, my office where I go to every day in the summertime, it can get quite warm here, as I've already said. So I come into work at about 7.30 in the morning. I open up every window throughout the entire office. I bring the temperature down, but once the temperature outside equals the new temperature inside, we shut all the windows, close all the blinds, and we're mostly good until about five in the afternoon where our arms can start to stick into the desk and it becomes a little bit uncomfortable, but then you go home. But that's kind of the key. Open up the windows, come in early, that's it. And there's really no need for air conditioning. But you know, quite frankly, in the long run, when we look at the air conditioning habits of Americans versus its European counterparts, it's really hard to not just see the absolute hypocrisy in all of this. After all, in light of international agreements on climate change and energy reduction, America's air conditioning addiction will make it harder for the United States to ask other countries to continue to abstain from using it in order to save energy. In fact, according to researcher Stan Cox, as he says, quote, the bottom line is that America's a big, rich, hot country. But if the second, fourth, and fifth most populous nations India, Indonesia, and Brazil, all hot and humid as well, were to use as much energy per capita for air conditioning as does the US, it would require 100% of those countries' electricity supplies, plus all of the electricity generated by Mexico, the United Kingdom, Italy, and the entire continent of Africa. However, it is worth mentioning that heating, not air conditioning, is the biggest energy hog. In fact, the United States uses four times as much energy heating homes as it does cooling them, although that gap has been closing. Like for instance, heating a home from 30 degrees to 70 degrees Fahrenheit is a 40 degree temperature change, but cooling from 90 to 70 is only 20, which is half. So really, one of the big questions that we wanted to understand more in depth is, why exactly did Americans choose to use predominantly forced air heating and cooling systems? I mean, after all, when you look at radiant floor heating, it's far more efficient and cost effective in the long run. And believe me guys, I did a ton of digging onto this subject and it took me a few hours, 
but ultimately the answer that I got for why this system predominates in the United States is just quite frankly, it's more convenient. This is what she's done all day. I mean, after all, they connect in most homes to an already set up gas lines and vents. Plus they share ducts and vents with the central air conditioning system that most homes have in the United States. They can also be conveniently controlled with just a simple temperature setting on a thermostat. And in addition, forced air systems are maybe arguably easier to work on for maintenance needs. All right, so I think in the future, we could probably do another video of the pros and cons of forced air versus radiant heat, but we have a lot to tackle in this video. Maybe it would be better for us to ask you, do you have experience with the forced air heating and cooling and radiance? Which one do you prefer? Yeah, I, again, I think there's a lot to unpack here and ultimately we would love to hear from you. So please let us know down in the comment section below. Okay, so in that very last section, we just wrapped up talking about how geography plays a role in the use of AC in the United States and the differences in Germany. However, part of this discussion though should also really include the role that history and different geopolitical events also played in the choice of heating systems in both countries and the restrictions that were placed on heating and cooling both in the United States and here in Germany. And to tell this story, we'll take you back to the 1970s, which had two oil crises which rocked the United States and Germany. So the first oil crisis in 1973 led to an increase of crude oil prices by more than 300% within less than two years. At that time, the explosion in the retail price of heating oil was affecting almost entire societies. Now, one could argue that this oil crisis in 1973 didn't affect the US as badly as it did Germany because at that time, the US still used a lot more natural gas for its heating needs. And ultimately, it isn't a coincidence that the 1973 oil crisis consolidated Germany's existing plans to cooperate with the USSR for natural gas. While OPEC's rising prices doubtlessly made Soviet resources appear more attractive, waning trust in the Middle East further bolstered the Soviet Union's reputation as a reliable trading partner. But let's keep this analysis focused on heating and cooling, not just energy production. Reacting to this development, unlike the United States, most European governments impose regulatory policies in the building sector aiming especially at new constructions, mainly by means of setting tight limitations of the thermal transmissivity values of the building's envelopes, of reducing the ventilation rates, and of increasing the minimum efficiency values to be achieved by new boilers. Okay, so fast forward to 1979. And at that time, Iran's secession of its oil supplies, which by the way, amounted to 10% of the entire global market, led to again a huge price increase. Since Iran was its chief supplier, West Germany was hit particularly hard and had to look to other countries for imports. And also Japan, Italy, the Netherlands, and the United States, who were also bulk buyers, also felt this squeeze financially. And the results of these two oil crises were twofold. First, Germany needed a very efficient way of heating their homes, and the added cost of air conditioning was not in the equation. But again, guys, I feel like I need to leave just a little bit of like a disclosure here to all of this. Uh, these events are just a couple of reasons for why the energy use, the predominant heating and cooling systems, how it ended up to the way it is today. Ultimately, you could give an entire semester long course on this topic alone, and we're trying to do our best here to give you a general summary of how everything ended up to be the way it is. But I think it's important to point out that before we close out this section, climate change has been playing a role in recent years. And quite frankly, it's put Germany in a pretty un comfortable situation. Because of Germany's climate, there hasn't been historically a need for air conditioning. However, the times seem to be changing. 
According to evaluations by the State Institute for Environment, Measurement, and Nature Conservation, they confirm the climate change trends. In 1953, for example, Stuttgart still had 25 ice days and an equal number of summer days. By 2009, the number of summer days in Stuttgart had risen to 45, while the number of ice days had fallen to just 15. And it's important to note here, with so many warm days, the number of window and portable air conditioners, the sales have been rising. Yeah, I think anybody who has been living in Germany for the past few years and have gone through one of those heat waves in the summertime, yeah, if you tried to head over to Bauhaus to buy yourself an air conditioner, you probably would have found that they were completely sold out. But you know, honestly, we've heard plenty of other reasons for Germany's resistance to air conditioning. Yeah, in talking with some of our German friends and colleagues, they've listed off a litany of reasons for why Germans really don't tend to embrace air conditioning, like us Americans do. They've listed everything from the fact that, quite frankly, German buildings are just older and it's harder to retrofit central AC units into them. And if they do, that's kind of why they generally just tend to have window units. But they've also listed out other things, including statements like, air conditioning makes you sick, which I thought was quite interesting. So we know that we have a pretty sizable German audience, so this would be a really good opportunity for us to ask you, do you agree with having an air conditioner in a private home? Yeah, and if you're actually one of those people who lives in a pretty warm part of the country, like 40 degrees C, did you cave and buy an air conditioner yourself for your own home? Or do you have any other tricks to keep yourself cool in the summertime? Yeah, please guys, leave those down in the comment section below. Again, we would love to hear from you. This is always such a really fun part of these videos. Okay, so now at this point in the video, we wanna turn the tables a little bit and talk about our home that's under construction because what we've recently found is actually super fascinating. Um, our house, for example, uses radiant underfloor heating as its primary heat source. It's great because it means that individual rooms can be temperature controlled, I guess, room by room, which means you can set the temperature to exactly how you like it, or you can turn the heat down in the rooms that you're not using at that time. So where the hot water comes from for our underfloor heating was super, super interesting for us. Our new town has something called a Fernwärme system or a district heating system, which means that we are part of a combined heat and power system. So essentially how this works, district heating is to supply of buildings with the heat and hot water as a form of thermal energy. The energy is delivered directly from the utilities combined heat and power plants via insulated underground pipes, to the connected residential buildings in the supply area. And interestingly enough, district heating is not only incredibly efficient, but it's also very environmentally friendly. And that's because in comparison to individual homes needing to heat and cool the hot water for their own individual use, the collective community can harness the power of a system that has, by comparison, a lot lower harmful carbon emissions. However, like we mentioned before, this kind of district heat system is actually incredibly efficient when used in combination with a combined heat and power system. And interestingly enough, the German city of Dusseldorf is a wonderful example of this. In Dusseldorf, energy sources are burned in the boiler in the combined heat and power plant. In this system of producing power, steam is produced, the energy of which is converted into a rotary motion by a turbine, similar to a bicycle dynamo, in a generator that generates electricity from the rotary movement, which is fed into the power grid. However, this kind of energy production generates waste heat. The heat produced then reaches the buildings in the vicinity of the power plant by means of water or steam via a well-insulated pipe system. So for our house, the hot water that flows in to heat our floors is taken straight from this district heating system. And we have a meter on our house which will measure the amount of hot water that we use and then we are billed accordingly every single month. 
However, our municipality takes a slightly different approach to the production of this district heating system than that of Dusseldorf. Our city is able to utilize 100% hydroelectric power and solar power to provide the energy needs for its residents. And while I guess this does produce some heat as a byproduct, our city actually uses a secondary heating source for the generation of district heating. So specifically, our town uses the burning of wood chips that have been supplied from the surrounding black forest to heat up the water that's then distributed through this district heating system. According to our energy producer's website, wood is a CO2 neutral fuel, since burning wood produces as much carbon dioxide as a tree consumes when growing. In their perspective, wood chips are therefore not only cheaper, but also more environmentally friendly than conventional energy sources such as coal, oil, or gas. And the wood chips are obtained either from forest maintenance wood, sawdust wood, or landscape maintenance wood. And in order to keep the additional CO2 emissions during transport as low as possible, again, they obtain their wood chips from the surrounding black forest to avoid additional environmental pollution. Okay guys, so we have thoroughly enjoyed all the research that's gone into the production of these videos. And as always, we love hearing from you on what you would like to see on future content in this video series. So please keep those suggestions coming, write them down below in the comment section and let us know what you would like us to tackle next. And as always guys, if you liked what you saw today, be sure to hit that thumbs up button. And for more content from the Black Forest family, hit that subscribe button. And until next time, this bulb. Cheers. wanted to talk a lot and let me just start the lot. 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 You did kind of want to kind of you did kind of want to kind of kind of want to kind of kind of want to kind of That's some nice Midwest talk there. I kind of want I was reckoning I was thinking about things. I was kind of wanting to kind of <laughs> talk about that. Oh man. Okay. Mm. Anyway. Seem like Europe and the United States were like latitudinally 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 <laughs> 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 that's, gonna be, that's gonna be my new word. I like know latitudinally. <laughs> what you say? It's both of them combined. It's like it's like a forty five. You say longitudinally. <laughs> it just sounds funny. Is that even a word? I don't know. I'll Google it. <laughs> don't Google it. I don't want to know. For the thermal transmissity, trans transmissive transmissive. God, it's like I'm learning German again. Thermal transmissive, transmissivity? Transmissivity? Yeah, transmissivity. God, that's a hard word. It's like every German word I have to learn. I suck at English too. Okay, pissed off. <laughs> Mainly by... <laughs> Nail it.